Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ball and Breakfast podcast with Wayne. I'm Patrick, uh, coming to you with uh, week six here. So through five in the NFL, uh, Wayne and I have covered every single week, uh, most all of the games except for one Thursday, but um, in general, trying to give you our best breakdowns and predictions of what's going to happen. We try to give you, you know, the Vegas implications if you're placing bets or doing parlays or whatever else. So you know, stick with us here. We're not always right, but I think we do a pretty darn good job at getting pretty close to, uh, you know, some outcomes here. So uh, I guess without further ado, we'll kick it off for this week. Um, we'll start on Thursday night. It's going to be the Denver Broncos going on the road to take on the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Man, you know, there's not a team I hate more than the Broncos. Like, not only do they suck, it'd be different if they, you know, were, uh, you know, talking shit and everything like that. And you know a good team that that actually makes it more exciting, but they're talking shit and they're a crappy team. So yeah, you know with Sean Payton like also yelling at Russell Wilson <laughs> for not throwing the ball away at the end of the game. Like there's just a lot of internal strife, and I think everybody was cheering for Nathaniel Hackett, which it's like how many people will cheer for you know a a failed uh, head coach? Just the way that Sean Payton's handled that whole situation is just. It's 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 honestly kind of cast like a bad light in my opinion for Sean Payton in this sense. So like yeah, you just don't call out a previous head coach about like oh they did a terrible job or something like that. Just really kind of mocking them. So um, I don't know. Yeah, I all all that being said, the Broncos have been terrible. Uh, if you got Pacheco on your fantasy team, definitely start him because yeah, the Broncos have been giving up some points. They've been getting up some yardage on the ground. Um, it looks like Kelsey, uh, he had had a twisted ankle, but I think he's going to be back. I think Andy Reid says he's expecting him to play even in the short week. So was able to play, you know, the second half and score a touchdown there too on that, you know, in that twisted ankle there. So looks like he's good to go. Uh, yeah, not too many other things to say, I feel like. Uh, Chiefs, it looks like it's a 10 and a half. I might take the over in this case. Uh, yeah, just the Broncos have not been playing that well. I always understand that the Chiefs in these, you know, big uh, spreads, they oftentimes will, you know, go go the under. But I think in this case with the Broncos, at least for me, I'm going to be at least cheering for the over in my, you know, in my viewpoint here. Yeah, um, I do have Pacheco. I'm considering playing him. I also have Eckler coming back. And um, who else? Mostert, Damian Pierce. Mm. I feel like there's another good running back in there. Kyron Williams. Um, so I'm, I'm having some issues right now trying to decide who to play, but, you know, looking down and seeing, you know, Pacheco going in, going against the number one, you know, most points allowed to a running back, uh, defense, it looks pretty, pretty appetizing there. So no, I'm with you on that. Um, yeah, this Denver team, I don't get it. Uh, you know, Zach Wilson, you know, under 200 yards, an interception, uh, you know, played pretty poor football and they still happened to win by 10. Uh, Brees Hall looked like, you know, obviously a, a complete back and kind of, you know, returning to his old form from last year and stuff in this kind of game. So, yeah, Denver just looks to be like a team you can just definitely poke holes in, you know, on the offensive end. And, and who better to go up against them than the Kansas City Chiefs, like you're mentioning with, obviously, Mahomes. You got Kelsey, uh, Pacheco, as we've mentioned, Rasheed Rice, again, getting more involved in the offense. Um yeah, they're gonna they're gonna exploit Denver um, up and down that defense. Um, you know, in Kansas City, that's always kind of tough to be on the road and in a in a prime time you know type matchup. I don't think KC's gonna you know let up or you know try to you know fall back on any sort of uh, lead they may be building here toward you know one or two seed or something like that. So yeah, give me KC. Um, you know, I think I've been a little bit more encouraged with Denver's effort at the very least. I think they're starting to, you know, close some gaps here on the actual spreads and stuff. So, you know, potentially with, you know, more spotlight being put on the game, maybe they'll they'll show out a little bit more. But um, did you actually mention the spread for this game? Yeah, it was a ten and a half, ten and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go on the I'll go I'll, I'll take the under on this one. I'll take the under. Uh, gotcha. I think the Broncos will play competitive enough, but they're still going to get beat um probably by a touchdown. Yeah, and this is like a divisional game, so those tend to just be closer cuz there's so much more familiarity in there. Um I do believe I think Justin Simmons, he is I think he's questionable, so that maybe one thing to keep keep an eye out on. 
you know, uh, with the safety with like Justin Simmons versus like Kelsey, that could lower the score a little bit there. Uh, so just something to keep an eye on, but it, it honestly hasn't stopped too many other defenses, uh, or offenses, I should say from scoring on this Broncos defense. So, uh, and yeah, you know, with Patrick Mahomes, he's going to exploit the crap out of this Broncos defense for sure. And then, yeah, being able to run with Pacheco, I think that'll be key for them too. So, cause yeah, this run, the run defense of the Broncos is like historically awful. And, you know, I'm all for given like everything that Sean Payton said, basically. So, Yeah. Agreed here. Uh, let's move on to the Sunday slate. We're going to go over C's to, to London and uh, look at the Ravens taking on the Titans. Uh, Wayne, who do you have here? Yeah, so, you know, Ravens had a bunch of turnovers against the Steelers, and that's kind of been their MO this season, is just committing or, you know, basically giving away the ball a bunch, you know, with Lamar, just whatever for whatever reason, like he's been very loose with the ball this season. Uh, had that block punt, too, for safety. <laughs> Almost a touchdown, uh, right? And then also the, the Ravens wide receivers. I think that was the biggest culprit. It wasn't necessarily that uh, Lamar Jackson had a terrible game. There, his wide receivers dropped the ball a bunch. So, um, you know, I'm thinking that they'll possibly correct that here. Uh, tight ends, you know, lost uh, against the Colts there. Kind of a disappointing fashion. They just couldn't get that fourth and one conversion near the goal line with Derrick Henry out of all people, right? So... Um, but you know, I think the offense for the Ravens, I think they'll be able to move the ball. I think the wide receivers, they'll be able to catch the ball here and there and, uh, you know, have it not, have, not have as many turnovers, uh, and yeah, just be able to get the ball to their playmakers here. So, um, it's, uh, it's a four point spread in favor of the Ravens. Um, I might go, I might go over in this case. I just might go a little bit over. Uh, I know the Titans usually play pretty close games. Uh, that's just been, you know, their identity since like Mike Vrabel's taken over. But in this case, yeah, I'm going to go with the over for the Ravens here. Uh, you know, favored by four. Yeah. Um, I'm with you. I think, you know, obviously there are a lot of huge drops in last week's game against the Steelers. Andrews, especially like he's Mr. Reliable for the most part out of, you know, Lamar's receiving core, um, that Beckham fade route that was supposed to, you know, maybe get toward the back of the end zone where the pick you know, went down. It looked like it was kind of a, not only a sloppy throw, but maybe just, you know, felt like ODB kind of gave up on the route. Um, probably should have targeted that back pylon instead of, you know, trying to, you know, you know, push it through that needle. Uh, just a little bit too close to Joey Porter got the pick. Um, but there, yeah, there were a lot of big drops that were reported. Um, you know, Nelson Aguilar being another one, surprise, surprise. Bateman kind of being non-existent in that offense. Uh, it's been a weird, it's been a weird offense for them. I think, you know, still losing Dobbins early on was just such a killer. Cause I think it's the type of the team that would love to establish run with Lamar and a, a back like, you know, Dobbins. But when you're, you know, going to Justice Hill, Gus Edwards, others, it's like, I don't know, feels like you have to kind of fan it out a little bit and, uh, you know, kind of go against maybe naturally what they'd like to do. But I think they're too good of a team. Their skill players are, are better than what they showed last week. And, yeah, defense has been pretty tenacious regardless. So, you know, you go up against Tennessee, you know, Tannehill, he's really reaching his last, you know, games here. I feel like they may as well, you know, if they lose this one, they may as well just push, you know, the keys on over to, you know, Will Levis and give it a shot or, you know, try, um, you know, Bleak uh, Willis one more time or something like that before maybe going down to Levis or something. But, you know, it's been really disappointing. I didn't have a lot of faith in Tennessee this year. The defense has been their only you know, shining spot, I'd say, of this team. Um, even Henry, I mean, it feels like he's kind of, you know, maybe his his beast mode days are kind of nearing their end as well. It feels like Ty J uh, Spears has been more involved in, you know, whether, whether it be the rush or the pass or something like that, they're getting him more ingrained in that offense. Like, I don't know if it's, you know, handing him the keys over to at some point, but maybe just more of like a split type situation between those two, like a thunder-lightning combination. But, um in any case, it just feels like Baltimore is a better team, and I think, I think this one will be a three-point game, but I, I will go with Baltimore. Yeah, like I said, the Titans keep it really close with that defense, uh, and you know if their offense could just make a couple plays, that really just you know uh, gets it to that closer to that three-point uh, game there. So, uh, and yeah, the Ravens, if they keep on turning the ball over, keeping making stupid mistakes like they have in the past couple games, then that, that three point, uh, spread definitely makes sense here. So definitely. 
Um, our next one, we've got the Washington Commanders going on the road into Atlanta to take on the Falcons. Yeah, so the Falcons here, man, Desmond Ritter, you know, we were like, at least I was, I was like, who is this guy? He's nothing. I feel like, all right, they're they're just going to look like, uh, buy some time for whatever, uh, you know, hot prospect they can get in this next year's draft uh, or some sort of other free agent out there. You know, we, we were kind of toying around Justin Fields a little bit. Uh, but had a hell of a game, you know, passed for over 300 yards, game-winning drive uh, for Koo for the field goal there, you know, with under two minutes. Um, I think the key will be, like, if the commander's defensive line can actually show up, you know. Uh, they didn't show up against the Bears there. Uh, they have a bo- bottom 10 uh, run defense, which is kind of surprising with, again, that defensive line with all those first-round picks and everything. Like, their defense just not, has, has not played up to par to what, you know, their talent and their payroll – uh, says they ought to be, you know, performing as. So, um, you know, I think that's just like one key thing is it, are they able to uh, win the line of scrimmage there on the defensive side of the ball for the commanders? Um, you know, commanders, they didn't really go to McCorn or Dotson that much. They passed the ball like 51 times in this last game. Like each of them only had like five targets uh, out of those 51 pass attempts, which, you know, for a player like McCorn and then also Dotson, it's like, give them the ball. <laughs> Why are they getting the ball? So, uh, and it also just looks like Ron Rivera has checked out. So for me, all that being said, uh, Falcons look really, they, they look really good at home. You know, it's that home cooking. It's, it's, you know, the, the field, the stadium, the, the fans and everything. They just seem to play a lot better at home. So I'm going to pick Falcons. They're favored by two here. That's always a fun one. Uh, I don't know if I take a bet either way, but you know, uh, especially if the commander's defensive line is able to get pressure and, you know, kind of stifle the run a little bit. But I, I feel like the Falcons with Desmond Ritter, you know, making some plays here and there to Kyle Pitts, uh, I think they'll be able to win this game. Yeah, um, really encouraging to see Pitts and London actually be part of the offense for once. Um, forgot that they were even, you know, on the field most weeks here. Um, but I think this is the kind of mix that they need to go with uh, to win more ball games. I mean, you gotta you gotta target you know some of your main players like like those two. I mean, they're too high of draft picks, too high of talents to be kind of just meant to be uh, blocking receivers. You know, um, love the run game, love what they're able to establish there. Um, but I think they can be more uh, multifaceted, and you know, they obviously play pretty good defense. I mean, even going on the road and taking a loss to the Lions, I felt like they still put up a really good fight defensively. So. You could just tell this team's really, you know, buying into what Arthur Smith is, smel- uh, you know, selling up to this point. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm all for it. I'm going to go Atlanta as well in this one. Washington has been stumbling as of late. Um, they're really up and down. I mean, sometimes it feels like they're giving a really good competitive effort, even in a loss. But then, you know, come and get blown out by the Bears in prime time. It's kind of like that's just really sad, man. But it it also kind of leads back to what my concerns with Washington, you know, truly are. It's like. You know, his team continuously, like, disappoints. It doesn't matter what expectations are kind of placed on them. They're always, you know, the type of team to, you know, kind of underperform, underwhelm a bit. Um, You know, still, Sam Howell's young. I think he's putting up, you know, really great stats, but, you know, that doesn't always translate into wins. Um, You know, I think the defensive line is a bit overrated. It seems like Chase Young is somewhat of a bust to this point. I mean... I think a lot of people are thinking of him as like this all world talent, but he hasn't really performed since his rookie year. I mean, he's been injured. He's, you know, not, not going in getting a ton of sacks. He's not creating a ton of pressure. Um, I feel like the other guys on the line, like Montez sweat, definitely getting his numbers. Uh, Jonathan Allen's, you know, plugging up holes, Deron Payne um, as well, just kind of in the interior, but yeah, it just feels like, you know, maybe it's just more name cachet that it really is, you know, true talent. And, uh, you know, for the Bears to hang 40 on them, uh, <laughs> kind of unforeseen. But, I mean, it just really speaks to, like, what what kind of liabilities, um, you know, they may have in the secondary and also, you know, kind of questioning their, their character, their heart, their grit. I mean, that's not a game you should be losing, um, let alone in that fashion, I feel like, uh, you know, with the Bears obviously struggling out of the gate. So, you know, for them to get Atlanta in Atlanta, um, it's going to be a tough one. Um I still think for whatever reason, this may be a little bit closer than, you know, expected. Um, I'd imagine this be under a touchdown uh, in, in differential there. Um, but I have, you know, the Falcons going over. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, this commander's team, I was kind of like, maybe they could make a run there, but yeah, they, they definitely haven't shown that they have, like, at least on the defensive side. I think that's the biggest thing for me is the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, they, they just have not uh, played up to their their capabilities there, you know? So, like, I was kind of, like, that was what I was banking on against the Bears was that their defensive uh, line would just be able to bulldoze over, like, a lot of them are our second uh uh, second hour depth chart offensive lineman there, you know, like uh, you know Cody White here, like he was uh, playing center there in the second half, and he was like, you know, kind of struggling to get that snap uh, in the proper manner. Like it always felt like Justin Fields was trying to was catching it up a high. So uh, yeah, kind of disappointing for them. And yeah, the Falcons have a lot of things going on. I think, especially at, at home. So yeah, uh, g- glad we're both uh, looking for the Falcons to get some get a V here. For sure. In this next one, we got the Seattle Seahawks going on the road to take on the Cincinnati Bengals. This will be a good one. This will be a good one. And, you know, part of me thinks is like this is going to be kind of that test, that barometer test, right, uh, for the Bengals. Like, all right, uh, you, you're, you guys are notorious for coming out the gate pretty slow. You know, Joe Burrow has not looked the best. Uh, we were, we all kind of had our doubts, but in Joe Burrow fashion, he was he's been able to kind of weather the storm. Had a you know pretty good game out there, just tossing over to Jamar Chase. Love what Jamar Chase did with the whole like seven eleven tweet because you know he's always he said he's always open, and you know, that was kind of the case. I think he caught what fifteen passes out of six nineteen targets his previous game. So you know T Higgins out, it was like yeah we're gonna give this guy the ball. Um, and then, you know, got, was able to get the pick six there with Cam Taylor Britt. So the defense, they showed up there against the the Cardinals who didn't really turn over the ball, like basically all season there. So good on them for all that. Um, and then, yeah, you had, you had the Seahawks. I think the, I was trying to research of like, you know, Pete Carroll and how he kind of operates coming off of a bye week which they're doing uh, for this game. Uh, the Seahawks are 0-3 in their last three games coming off the bye. You know, and I, I think that's just, you know, utilizing the most recent data here for whatever it is, the the makeup of the team with the roster that they have right now. Um, yeah, they just don't seem to perform that well coming off the bye and, you know, going to be in Cincinnati as well uh, with that team that they have. Uh, you know, I'm sure that you know, the Bengals, they're very much looking to get back on track with everything that they've have had the ambitions going into the season. So for me. With all that being said, you know, the Seahawks are definitely an up and down kind of team. Uh, but, you know, they have been playing pretty well overall. Uh, just against the Bengals, though, I feel like yeah, the Bengals, they're they're going to take care of this, t- uh, take care of business here. They're two and a half favorite. Um, I'm going to go the over uh, just because, you know, I, I think that Bengals offense is going to be able to get some points with Jamar Chase, I think. Burrow, Jamar Chase, they got they got that hot button going on for them, and I don't know if there's any team that can you know keep up with them. Even yeah, the the Seahawks with their defensive backs there. So yeah, I'm gonna agree with you again. Uh, take the over on Cincinnati. Obviously, we picked uh, the Cardinals to you know beat the Bengals. I wouldn't even call it an upset based on the tone we were taking to that game. Because for me, again, like when it comes to the Bengals, when they're healthy, we know what they should be we know they they are in a lot of ways but when we have a joe burrow that's just you know getting swallowed up um you know obviously below 200 yard games you know truly not himself you know speaking about an injury going into this year with the calf like everything about that um you know that start for the bengals just spoke to me and in a sense that you know burrow's not healthy and we don't know when he'll be healthy and you know people were whispering whether an ir stint was possible and stuff like that so when I know that kind of thing is going around, I mean, it really gives me a lot of negative vibes. And then, you know, for them to just kind of swing right back. I mean, I know the Cardinals, you know, I mean, for me, still a team that should end up in the bottom five uh, when it's all said and done. So it's not like I, you know, thought the Cardinals were some sort of, a, you know, dark horse team or something like that. But it's just, you know, we needed to see we needed to see something like that from from Burrow, from Chase, from the rest of the guys, because as we as we did witness, it's like when Burrow is right and he's getting chased the ball primarily, it really opens up the rest of that offense. Other guys are able to get in on the action, mix in, you know, the other receivers um, in their core, Tyler Boyd, uh, Irwin, et cetera. And uh, 
I think it also fires up the defense. I mean, Trey Hendrickson had two and a half sacks. He's been red hot lately. Um, I'm in an IDP league and he's definitely like a trending defensive lineman right now. He's getting, you know, added everywhere and stuff like that for those that didn't, you know, scoop him up earlier. So, you know, Burrow is this, you know, the straw that stirs that drink. I think they get home, you know, Seattle obviously completely wrecked the Giants in the, you know, the week prior to, to the bye. So I expect them to be competitive here, but it just feels like if Burrow's good, and this team is good, they should be one of the top teams in the league. And I think with that kind of confidence, with, you know, this this win that they actually absolutely needed to have, I think, you know, going into this next week, I think they're just going to keep rolling. You know, I think they're going to start, you know, a little streak here and uh, nothing on Seattle really to, you know, speak illy, you know, illy, illy of them, but it's just like for them to be, you know, the next one up against a team like this, I just, I see them uh, falling a bit short. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to our defense, I think, yeah, we both picked the Cardinals. Uh, yeah. It was like, I mean, I think James Conner got hurt. So that, that kind of stopped them from running the ball a little bit there. Uh, yeah, although Di Mercado did get a touchdown. So, uh, but yeah, it was like, you know, I, I, I don't think I was expecting like a Joshua Dobbs to, I think he had like 35 pass attempts that game. Uh, I would, if I, if I saw that, I'm like, yeah, they're going to lose. They're going to lose, uh, the game there. So, uh, yeah, like we were expecting to run the ball, and that could be the, that. Really, is I think the key to this game. If the Seahawks are able to run the ball against the Bengals, who you know the Bengals, I think this previous game, uh, they did give up some you know pretty big runs there, uh, especially on the end rounds, which I think I try to call out on with like Marquise Brown, and I obviously saw that Rondale Moore fake to Marquise Brown. I think uh, he that was an awesome fake. Like I got faked down, he ran for like 20, 30 yards there. So. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I do. I definitely have my question marks about at least the Bengals and you know, at least the run defense for right now. And if you yeah, had the Seahawks are able to, you know, they have, you know, kind of more uh, and, you know, they have some awesome wide receivers too there. Um, and, you know, uh, Chabernet as well as a running back. So I feel like they have the, the tools, you know, but yeah, if the Bengals are able to stop the run, get them, you know, the Seahawks strictly passing and get that, uh, get that touchdown early on and, you know, have a, uh, Gina Smith backpedaling. This is definitely a game to be very much so in favor of the Bengals here. So, but yeah, looking forward to this matchup uh, for two teams that it's like one is on the up and up, and the other ones. Okay, we'll, we'll see what you got next, uh, Seahawks. Agreed. In this next one, we've got the Carolina Panthers going on the road against the Miami Dolphins. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Uh, I mean. You know, the Dolphins, I, I think I, saw, I remember you talking about uh, Raheem Moster, right? Like, on your fantasy team, like, you, you definitely got to be utilizing him. Uh, A-Chain <laughs> looks like, you know, he's been hurt. He got hurt. Uh, he's going to be out for, I think, at least several weeks. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be nuts again with that run. I think the Dolphins are, like, averaging, like, seven yards a, a carry, like, as a team. Like, that's sick. That's just sick. So, uh you know, I don't know what the uh, the Panthers are pulling up in terms of run defense, but, you know, they don't have any wins this season, so can't all be that good. And, you know, two is playing very much at that MVP level. So, you know, I definitely have the Panthers here. It looks like they're a 13 and a half point favorite, the Dolphins. So, you know, I don't know what to do with that. That's definitely a big margin. Uh, but the Dolphins have been blowing teams out. Like That's that's just been the, the thing this season, especially against – weaker teams like the Panthers. So I don't know if you go over, maybe you do here in this situation, but yeah, uh, Dolphins pulling out of their minds. If you're fancying over Raheem Mostert, like you got definitely got to uh, take him up on, on there. So, and then whatever backups they got, you know, cause they're going to get some carries probably too in garbage time. So yeah, give me Dolphins going to take this in a landslide here. Man. Yeah. 13 and a half is, is a lot. Um, <laughs> man, it's a lot. It's hard to know. It's hard to know, though. I mean, I feel like maybe I'll stay on the under just to be polite. I mean, I feel like without uh, HN, it's like a little bit different, you know, of an offense, at least from, you know, what he's been able to bring to that team in just limited carries, too. It's like he he's not even getting 50 percent of the snaps, it seems like, and he's still putting up 100 yard games and stuff. So to take a weapon like that out and uh you know, replace him with Jeff Wilson coming back from IR. It'll be a different running game for sure for Miami. Um, 
Not that they'll have to use it really. They can just go, you know, to some of their weapons outside. But no, I mean, they should have a positive game script and be handing the ball off a lot to Moster, which to me, I couldn't be happier about, not only because I have Moster on my team, but I also dropped Achon at the beginning of the season. So for me, this is kind of like my redemption, like in my <laughs> my safety, because I felt so salty about letting him go after getting a, a DMP or whatever. But um, the things I'll say, we we know what Miami is. We know what they're they're doing so far this season. I expect them to just take care of business. They're very locked in, especially as a team. It's really refreshing to see. I don't see them dropping a kind of you know this kind of game where you know maybe maybe they let their guard down a bit. I just don't think they're that type of team. So um, I expect them to handle their business. Um, I was able to see Carolina play football uh, live last week in Detroit. So. Um, very fun weekend, obviously got some great seats, uh, almost near, you know, midfield, uh, at the 300 level is like a perfect view of the game, to be honest with you. But man, I saw first and, you know, firsthand how Bryce Young plays football at the pro level. Um, granted he may not have the best offensive line out there, but there's one thing that I consistently saw was him holding the ball way too long, that pocket collapsing a bit and him being very good at scrambling out of the pocket and throwing the ball out of bounds. The entire game, it was him reading for way too long, missing his first look, scrambling out of the pocket and getting rid of the ball and throwing it out of bounds. I mean, he's very good at that. He doesn't take sacks, but uh, yeah, man, it's hard to get encouraged about what he is so far and what he's kind of experienced at the NFL level. Um, You know, he doesn't have the best weapons around, but, you know, Thielen still put up, you know, 11 plus receptions, I think, 100 plus yards, Chark looked very serviceable out there. Uh, Hayden Hurst was a safety blanket for him. Miles Sanders is MIA. He's not playing good football whatsoever. But um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I'm trying to get a read on like what Bryce Young will be at the pro level. And so far, I'm not I'm not seeing very good things. So they either need a better, you know, cast of offensive linemen for him, a a surefire number one, or we're just seeing a very average to below average NFL quarterback that's just going to struggle. I mean, maybe he's not seeing over the line. Maybe it's something that, you know, he's just, he's just mentally missing, you know, some, some quick reads, but yeah, I've been pretty discouraged uh, at his progress so far. And then the other thing I'll note is while watching the game, um, the defense, uh, not only were they just completely exploited by Detroit, uh, both in the pass and the run, but they gave up on each other. They, they, they truly gave up on each other. There was a play, I believe it was a, a third and short for the you know the Lions going in. I think they were you know thirty to forty yards out on on Carolina's territory. Um, a defensive lineman, a younger defensive lineman, you know, jumped the snap, got an offsides call, and two or three linemen started pointing fingers at him. Brian Burns was seen on the sideline throwing his helmet, just complaining. He was like kind of out of control. I mean, it was still I think like early in the second quarter and completely lost his mind. And I was like, you know, his team just looks like they're not together. They're pointing fingers. They've kind of given up and, you know, they gave up 42 points to the Lions. I watched, you know, play after play, uh, deep strike after deep strike. It was just like, this one's over. Uh, it felt over in the second quarter, to be honest with you. And I think it was, you know, 28-7 or something by the half or something. So, it's crazy. I mean, I'm going long winded here on Carolina. The expectations weren't super high this year, but I'm not seeing any progress. So with that, um, seems like it's going to be a very long season for them, which bodes really well for us as Bears fans. And I think they get, I think they get rocked again by Miami. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Thank you for the pick. It's been great. And I mean, that was my biggest <laughs> thing, at least when I was looking at that trade. Right. It's like, you know, usually with that. Uh, Usually with the young quarterback, you you need that veteran wide receiver, that that ace in the hole there with DJ Moore. So glad that they gave him to us. And you know, now yeah, we're you know, how about that trade? Like that that I I feel pretty good about that trade. Would it have been nice if we got Jalen Carter? Uh, I I'm happy with uh um uh with Wright and everything like that, but you know, is he the Jalen Carter level? I, I don't know what the who the favorite is maybe for uh, for defensive rookie of the year, but he definitely has you know, shown up pretty well uh, in every in all the games that I've seen him. But, uh, anyways, yeah, uh, Panthers not looking good, uh, and and really just goes to show like part of it. I feel like is you know, I, I think we put too much on the young quarterbacks. Like 
basically left up your franchise. It's like, no, they're not Jesus Christ or anything like that. Uh, give them the supporting staff. Give them the proper offensive scheme. Uh, give them some weapons, uh, you know, wideouts, running backs, whatever. Uh, like, that's just much more important than, you know, or, and also having a veteran quarterback there, too, to help them mold them, you know, mold their minds and everything. So things like that, I think, is much more fundamental. And, you know, I'll definitely go preach about, like, you know, the – the Green Bay Packers, although they're right now, it's not looking so good with Jordan Love at the moment. But yeah, having like, you know, quarterbacks sit there, learn, learn the culture, learn to be a professional, all those things a little bit more. So I think are more, uh, you know, more pertinent to being a, a solid NFL quarterback. So yeah, just not looking good for the Panthers right now. Yeah. And I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, going back to his size, his stature, um, you know, we're looking at guys like Zach Wilson, um, Kyler Murray's probably on the, you know, highest, highest percentage of the percentile levels of, of, of quarterbacks that are that, you know, that small, but you can definitely see the disadvantage in it. I was watching him behind line, him trying to, you know, look over the first, you know, the first set of, uh, of linebackers and down linemen and stuff. And it's like, you can barely see him. You can barely see him, you know, get his head over the line. And I'm like, that is a complete disadvantage. I mean, if you're Anthony Richardson, you're six, five, you're, you know, got the same, you know, you know, speed as a guy like Bryce Young. It's like you're just walking in with all sorts of advantages at the pro level. And maybe those those uh, disadvantages don't don't show as uh, prominently in the college game. You know, perhaps it's just his ability to to scramble, get on the run, find, you know, receiver downfield. Obviously, Alabama came with all sorts of talent as well on both sides of the ball, for that matter. But it's like, yeah, man, I'd love to see how this year you know pans out for him, what his future is. But again, just just looked, just looked very, um, you know, uh, I don't want to say lost, but he just seemed like he was running for his life in most uh, situations, and just really wasn't finding his guys and having to give up on a lot of plays. Yeah, yeah. And now, now the comparisons. I don't know if we want to do the comparisons. Like, all right, CJ Stroud is over there just killing it, like most yards like ever, <laughs> you know. Uh, through like five games and then yeah like no interceptions still uh, I mean their team isn't going anywhere this season but you know I I think for a rookie uh, season like yeah get it you know get me a few more weapons sure up the uh, the defense a little bit more like this team can definitely be something next season so yeah really I think there are different approaches that they had uh, but yeah you know really just goes to show kind of like what good coaching good uh, atmosphere. Danica Ryan's like he's he's done a heck of a job coaching uh, both sides of the ball there right now. Like their defense has been playing really well up to you know up to, to a different level. So yeah, uh, it really just goes to show like the situation really does matter for the quarterback. And I get why Caleb Williams is like I don't know if I wanted to go with the Bears here. Like <laughs> that. Yeah, let me see if I can pick and choose where I go here. So yeah, uh, situation definitely is uh, beneficial for a quarterback for sure. Yep. In our next one, we've got the Indianapolis Colts going on the road to take on the Jacksonville Jaguars. This is going to be a good one. This is going to be a good one. This is my upset here. I'm going to take the Colts. Uh, you know, <laughs> love it. Uncle Uncle Rico over there, Gardner Minshew. Like, I think he's like every game he plays, the Colts win. Actually, I think that's like I think that's what the the record says there. So. AR out again, you know, he's just been hurt and banged up. That's hopefully like that's not something in his career that he's just gonna be consistently doing. Uh, you know, so but they've been winning the games that he's been in. I love his attitude, I love his moxie, what he brings to his team, the excitement, uh, and everything there. Love Shane Sykin, what he's been able to do as a coach. He plays to the quarterback strength, you know, the way he plays Gardner Minshew. Definitely is different from the way he plays uh, Anthony Richardson, so, which is great and totally makes sense. So, and like I, I just really admire I think what Shane Seikens done for this team. You know, you look back on what he's been able to do with both Justin Herbert as a rookie, and then also young Jalen Hurts molding him to you know the quarterback he is today. Like he definitely deserved this uh, coaching position here, and has you know shown great strides I think for this Colts team. Uh, we'll see about the injuries on the defensive side, but you know, that's something to keep an eye on. I think, you know, Shaq Leonard, I think is that he's, he's questionable here. So just, you know, something to keep an eye on, but yeah, you know, the Jags coming back now from London, from vacation, you know, vacation, oftentimes you're like, you know, 
checking your emails and that could take a while. You're like still on vacation mode. Uh, so, you know, I feel like that's just kind of what they're going to be. Jags, it seems like they've always been kind of inconsistent in the past couple of seasons. So I'm kind of banking on that too. Uh, Colts looks like they're a four point underdog. So, you know, I'm going to be you know, going for that. And yeah, I just think that this is just a good way for, I don't know, Gardner Minshew, get that magic, uh, sh- show, you know, what, what he's all about here. And yeah, you know, they do have weapons. I, I, I do like, you know, Michael Pittman Jr., uh, Alec Pierce and everything there. So, uh, Downs looked, looked like he developed some chemistry with Downs as well. So, and, you know, another week with, uh, you know, I don't know, Jonathan Taylor hasn't really done much. It's so funny. Like, they paid him all this money now, and Zach Moss is, like, getting 120 yards or something. So, uh, funny how that all works there. But, you know, yeah, if they can get, you know, 80 90% of what Jonathan Taylor kind of was, like, that's that's just gravy on here. But, yeah, I got the Colts pulling off the upset on the road here against the Jags. I like it. I mean, I like this this pick because, you know, in week one, these two went toe-to-toe in Indy, and it came down to, you know, really the last score. So I think exactly the same way it's going to be played out this week is Richardson was out, Minshew came in, and, you know, things happen when he's in the game. I mean, he's 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 a good player. He should be a starting quarterback in the NFL. I think we, I think we should be seeing him as a starter somewhere, if not in Indy, somewhere else next year uh, permanently because you look at some of the other starters around the league, and I definitely think this guy holds his weight and it doesn't feel like they're at a disadvantage whatsoever. Um, that all said, I really like what Jacksonville has been doing. I agree. I think coming back from London is going to be a little shakeup for them. Um, you know, I think they probably do feel a little bit comfy now uh, when they go play games out there, but you know, the defense is the thing that's really, uh, you know, stepped up for me. I mean, they they looked a little bit lost out there, especially in the game against Houston when they gave up 37. But these last two weeks, I mean, seven points for the Falcons, 20 for the Bills. I mean, those are those are some pretty respectable totals to be limiting, you know, those teams to. And uh, I feel like both those teams have, you know, if not better, um, at least for the Falcons, probably a similar offense as the Colts. So, Oh man, I don't know. I mean, it feels like Ridley got more involved last week too, which was, you know, refreshing. He had a great, you know, week one with the Jags, but was pretty much lost. So um glad to see him, you know, back in the offense, uh, not only just for his sake, but also for my fantasy team's sake, because I traded Anthony Richardson for him uh, a week ago and feel really good about that now. So <laughs> anyways, um, I say all this, I think, I think this one's going to be close. I mean, it could actually be under the the four point spread. I think Jacksonville wins, but I think this is going to be a very, very close game. Yeah, I mean, it definitely feels like it that that way. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just think that Gardner Minshew positions the Colts to win more so than AR. Like point blank. Uh, not to say that Anthony Richardson, he definitely has all the potential, right? to be a starting quarterback in the NFL, but he needs to learn how to slide and not take so many big hits. Cause that's just been helping him, you know, blue or, you know, miss games basically. Um, you know, your biggest asset really is availability. Like you gotta be available in the NFL. Uh, otherwise, you know, yeah, you're not going to last that long here. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think Gardner Minshew, they've just been playing really well with him getting that moxie, but I do agree the Jags, been performing well i just think yeah they're they're gonna take you know uh a slight like oh yeah we need to like we're back in the u.s we need we need to focus here again here a little bit more but yeah gonna take the colts here for an upset sounds good man no i'm for it i think it's a it's a good upset to to put out there i mean for this week and uh yeah you're absolutely right i mean richardson um for his career you know definitely needs to start you know playing a little bit wiser we saw what happened with rg3 um, with the Redskins years ago, I uh, can't make the same mistake, but I think another point you raised too is Minshew helps to win ball games. And some guys in this league are stat aggregators. You know, I think a guy like Sam Howell, you're going to look down and be like, holy crap, that guy put up an you know excellent stat line. But at the end of the day, you know, Justin Fields, amazing stat lines at times, but it's like, doesn't always end in a W. So um, yeah, just love the heart that Minshew brings. And I, I yeah, I think this one's gonna be fun. I like, I, I kind of want to join you on the bandwagon for this upset, <laughs> but I feel too good about the Jags. I think I like them. It's more of a, you know, close to my heart type pick every time I, I make it. 
For sure, for sure. Yeah, no, I respect that. <laughs> Next one up, we got New Orleans Saints going on the road to take on the Houston Texans. Man, you know, uh, gave a lot of praise already to CJ Stroud. Uh, I think the Texans, they're good. Uh, you know, I, I just think that they need a little bit more. They're a little bit one-dimensional right now. And against a defense like the Saints, who the Saints, you know, they have, like, I think they have like a top 10, both in the run defense and pass defense as well. Um, that's really hard to come by. It's like, oh, they're just going to be focused on the pass. They're not going to be focused on Damian Pierce much. He really hasn't been able to get it going uh, for the Texans offense there. So, um, you know, I think that's a big, uh, that, that's a key thing there. You know, if Derek Carr can just like not turn over the ball <laughs> over and, uh, you know, play, play just good football. Uh, I think that, that that'll be enough to get that road win against the Texans there who, you know, they definitely have what, you know, lit some teams up, but yeah, uh, being one dimensional that, that they kind of are right now against a really good defense and a, you know, an offense is pretty formidable. Uh, it seems like Derek Carr has you know developed some chemistry now with Kamara. You know, a couple games in, having him in there, uh, and then yeah, having those two weapons there with Michael Thomas and then Olave as well. Uh, I just feel like yeah, the Saints. I think they're one and a half point favorites uh, to win. So uh, I don't know if I take the over, but uh, you know, because I, I definitely think it'll be close. Maybe it is a one. One score game, but yeah, I, I definitely have the the Saints winning this against the Texans on the road here. Man, this one's kind of tough. I mean, I feel like Houston's been playing some pretty good ball this year. Um, you know, it feels like definitely on the offensive end, be able to establish pass. They're kind of middle of the road when it comes to their defense, but have played tight games overall. Um, struggling to know what New England is. So when I look at a 34-0 Saints score, I'm like, how impressive is this? You know, really. But it is, no matter what. I mean, they definitely, you know, went out and did that, especially with Carr, you know, having the issues with the shoulder, um, reincorporating Kamara back into the offense. It's definitely, you know, hitting uh, Olave's uh, stats pretty hard, you know, out of the gate here. But um, they, they, they seem to tend to be a kind of a run-first type type team, New Orleans. So um, not, not super surprised there. But, uh, yeah, um, Houston lost a really tight one here to Atlanta. They were on the road, I guess, kind of coming back home. They've been, you know, pretty good, uh, at least there to start off this year. Man, this one's tough for me. I, you know, I'm just going to go with Houston. I'm just going to go with Houston. I feel like, you know, I think they have a lot of confidence as a team. I think, you know, they, they can play good enough defense to keep them in the game. And, you know, that offense has been pretty formidable. Um, I agree with what you're saying here. They haven't been establishing run uh, the way that they probably want to. I'm, I'm sure they're just going to continue to feed Pierce these, uh, you know, heavy volume of carries with really underwhelming results. But, you know, CJ Stroud may be able to do enough in the air to get them going. A um, little bit worried if they're without Tank Dell, that could take away a real, um, you know, playmaker from the offense. I know he was in concussion protocol uh, last week. Uh, Nico Collins has been, mm -hmm. you know, uh, establishing himself over there as the one. Um, Dalton Schultz, I think, got another score uh, last week. And, you know, I think they even have some Robert, you know, Woods action going on too. So um, that line is getting better as well. So maybe that can help put up a little bit of a defense against you know, uh, New Orleans D. But mm -hmm. um, again, I think this one would be pretty tight. You're... You're uh, probably you're probably making the better call here. I'm just going to go out on a limb and uh, you know maybe a little funniness in this one, but I'll just take Houston. Yeah, no, and that's totally fine. It, it's it's kind of has that same uh, moxie as like my Gardner and Minshew Colts pick in a way, but yeah, you know the Saints. I think the secondary is the key thing there, right? Like you know with Marshawn Lattimore, with uh, you know Alante Taylor and Honey Badger. I feel like between those three, like they should be able to you know, withhold uh, the wide receivers for the Texans there so that uh, CJ Stroud doesn't, isn't able to, you know, get that big one there. So, but no, it totally makes sense. Anything can happen any given Sunday here. And I feel like, yeah, this Texans team, whenever we think that they're good, maybe they're not so good. Whenever we think they're like going to lose, I feel like that's when they win. So uh, yeah, for me though, I, I'm going to stick with the saints getting the road dub here though. Sounds good. In this next one, we've got the New England Patriots going on the road to see an old friend in Las Vegas in uh, Josh McDaniels. Uh, it's a terrible matchup, but who do you got? 
<laughs> it is a terrible matchup. And yeah, there's also Jimmy G uh, for sure. So, you know, best looking quarterback there with the porn stars now in Las Vegas. So, uh, you know, the Pats offense, they look pretty damn bad. They look like, like who would have think like, oh, let's bring in Zappy here now. Let's see. He can't be any worse with what Mac Jones has been doing with that offense. And then. You know, I think Juju Smith-Schuster, I, I think I saw some mixed reports of him being hurt or questionable at least. So something to keep us like, all right, they're missing their best wideout right now. <laughs> like, what else What else do they got going? So against the Raiders, who had a pretty impressive showing, I think, against uh, the Green Bay Packers, uh, you know. So and then Max Crosby, he's he's going to get to uh, Mac Jones or Zappi or whomever they got a quarterback. Uh, yeah, this this team is not good. And then I think we mentioned last week yeah, with Judon, Christian Gonzalez, uh, he might be back or might not be back. He thinks he's up there, but Judon's at least out. And he was the best defensive player, uh, you know, for the Pats this season. So a lot of question marks, a lot of question marks for the Pats. So for sure, I'm going to go with the Raiders, three-point favorites. I'm going to take the over for that. You know, I think... Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be kind of like a revenge type of game against, you know, against the, the Pats here. And then yeah, De- having Devontae Adams too. I feel like, yeah, those two are just going to run up the, the score a little bit here against the Pats. Man. Yeah. This is really sad to be coming to this point. I've taken the Pats two straight weeks and they've gotten blown out by the Cowboys and the Saints respectively. So it's been really tough for me. And I think it comes down to two things for me trying to figure out with the Patriots, is it one, Mac Jones is a below average to terrible quarterback? Or is it two, has has Belichick taken a step back as a coach? Um, Either way, I'm looking at both those kind of elements here and asking myself like, you know, is this a Mac Jones problem? Or, you know, is it time to kind of turn the page on Belichick and, you know, obviously thank him for everything he's done for the organization, but more or less ask, you know, perhaps at the end of the year, like, can you gracefully, you know, resign from your post? Like, obviously you're never going to fire a guy like that, but, you know, just with the direction of the team and, you know, maybe it's just a little too tight. Maybe it's just a little bit too, you know, uh, strong handed in how maybe he, you know, goes about coaching these days or, you know, what roles he's asking of his players. I mean, it seems like if you don't have Tom Brady at the helm, like you can't expect for all of your offensive players to just kind of continuously, you know, try to feed into this system of his and, you know, wide receivers are pretty much non-existent in this offense. Uh, you know, the running backs have been pretty poor up to this point. Ramondre, Zeke, Hunter Henry was something the first couple of weeks. Now he's pretty much non-existent. And again, it's like, I asked myself, is this Mac Jones who, you know, really just doesn't belong in the NFL as a starter? Or again, is this Bill Belichick making some pretty poor schemes, just not, you know, putting his team in the best position to win, not trying to, you know, push the envelope a bit on offense? It seems like, you know, maybe Brady was all the magic that was in New England. And now, you know, that magic has has, has gone and, you know, disappeared in a lot of ways. And Belichick's kind of left to just put together some interesting, you know, defensive teams, defensive packages and stuff, but just as, you know, just coming up short in the offensive game and stuff. But like you're saying, injuries are piling up over there. They did acquire JC Jackson back from the Chargers, who is, you know, kind of a kind of a issue in the clubhouse and stuff, and just how hard he wanted to play for that team and stuff after getting his big contract and stuff. So so I don't know, man. This team's in shambles, but yet again they're going to Las Vegas. And I'm like, is third is the third time a charm? Like, do I do I just go ahead and do it? And uh yeah, man, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to pick oh, New England for no good reason. <laughs> and uh, if they burn me this time, man, I will truly know that this team is done. And this will be the last time I ever pick them. And, you know, they'll definitely be drafting at the top of the board for for this year's draft. Oh, man. Well, good luck with that. And, you know, I think it's a number of things with uh, yeah the Patriots. I mean, obviously some injuries here and there. But, yeah, drafting, I think, has been something for them, you know, uh, Christian Gonzalez, he's looked good. Uh, Kyle Duggar, he's looked good. But, you know, Mac Jones, he definitely has been up and down. Uh, just a lot of you know different players, I feel like, have not been able to play to whatever potential that, you know, Bill Belichick may have perceived. Like Tyquan Thornton in the second round last season. And, you know, he, 
he's been injured uh, this season, but really didn't do too much last season either. Whereas he was like known as a speedster, but nothing of merit with regards to his receiving skills whatsoever. So, you know, I don't know if uh, sometimes I feel like Bill Belichick like out thinks his coaching a little bit, or he just like overthinks it a little bit and, 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 as opposed to like, no, let's just go with like a formidable, you know, wide receiver that can run routes. Right. Like, what about mm-hmm. now? What, you know, what, as opposed to just thinking of you know, getting a speedster and then turning them into like a Tyree kill or some sort. So I don't know. Oh, yeah. I feel like, yeah, he, get, he gets in his own way with regards to, you know, s- some things like that. And yeah, with Mac Jones, I think that's a big thing too, but you know, injuries definitely haven't helped. And then, you know, uh, he, he keeps on bringing in the same old uh, faces from that have you know been fired from the head coaching jobs uh, previously to come back like Josh McDaniels and now like Bill O'Brien there and it's like I don't know man like do you got any other aces that you that you can pull up you know I know you're you're getting up there in age right like I think it's what seventy three or something like that now but like man uh, so, you got to bring something new to the table you got to say goodbye to the ex over there Tom Brady. And move on and see, like, okay, can I bring in something new? I know he just, like, went through a breakup, too. So, funny how that works. But, like, yeah, he has to bring in something new to the table. Something a little bit different. And, you know, whether it's, like, a Mac Jones change, which it sounds like, that's that's kind of, you know, what's what the direction is going to be going. Uh, something's got to change differently, I think, for their franchise. Or, yeah, just hang it up and kind of hand the keys over to the next person. Yeah, I mean, it's fair to say there will only be one Tom Brady. And I think that he truly believes in his mind that he can cultivate the next Tom Brady. And he, like, goes out and gets Mac Jones, who looks pretty much the part, um, goes out, you know, digs through the rubble, finds Bailey Zappi as his backup, and, like, you know, tries to make him a thing. Even when Brady first left, he was, like, bringing over Cam Newton, who could barely throw, you know, as obviously a star, but like was really much, you know, depending on his legs at that point and stuff. And it was just, again, like you're saying, it's just, he, he, he tries to be this mastermind, you know, technician and stuff. And I can bring over whatever pieces and make, you know, these things work. Cause I'm Bill Belichick. And it's like, man, I don't know. Uh, don't want to, don't want to throw any shade on his name or anything like that. But, um, you know, I think we can all see the impact of what Tom Brady meant to that organization. And, really makes you question, like, looking at some of those decisions since he left, like, truly, how special is Bill Belichick as a coach, you know? And especially as time continues to move on, it's like the game is just continuing to get smarter, more analytical. It's modernizing in its own way. When we're seeing a lot of new coaches, they're really putting their, you know, stamp on the game in, like, very, you know, explosive, fun ways. And it's like just the Pats are the most boring you know, uh, just, just kind of next man up kind of like everyone's like turning the wheel together kind of team. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's been very much mediocrity for a very long time. So, uh, maybe it's time that they got somebody else to kind of, you know, lead, lead that new machine and kind of, you know, change it up a lot. Yeah, no, it's, it, and it's interesting as you bring up that it's like seeing the differences between, the coaches that have come out of the Kyle Shanahan tree and then also the coaches that have come out of the Bill Belichick tree uh, and how they've, you know, kind of fared <laughs> off in their own endeavors, right? Kyle Shanahan, everybody, he's kind of like Andy Reid, right? Where like everything, everybody he touches, like his turn to gold, right? With, you know, I think Sean McVay came out of the tree, uh, Mike McDaniels, like those just a couple of ones there. So like, and those guys are killing it. Whereas, you know, Bill Belichick, I don't think, has there ever been a successful? I don't know if there has been a a successful head coach uh, that has come out of history. So like they've gone in coaching gigs, but none of them have actually like turned a franchise into a winner and, and have been able to do that on a consistent basis. So I don't know. For me, yeah, I, it definitely brings. It just really goes to show like how awesome Tom Brady was, and you know, I, I it seems like they kind of needed each other. Like you know. Uh, Bill Belichick definitely has this old school mentality on a lot of things and very militant. So whereas Tom Brady, you know, he definitely is very smart procedural, I think with, with everything he has, but you know, when they got uh, Randy Moss and everything, they, they showed, okay, I can air it out a little bit. So, uh, yeah, I, I think eventually they're, you know, I don't know what the, 
whole situation was, I guess, with them necessarily departing from each other. It seemed like Tom Brady just wanted to get more offensive weapons, and lo and behold, he's kind of right. So, you know, getting, you know, that by going over to uh, Tampa Bay and passing to Mike Evans and Godwin there. So, yeah, I feel like th- there just needs to be more invention there. And I don't know, yeah, maybe they do hire from the college Shanahan tree and then Bill Belichick uh, kind of, you know, hangs it up there. So, but uh, yeah, there's, it's just not looking good right now for Bill Belichick and the Pats right now. Right. Go get some real talent. Stop, you know, trying to find these basement bargain bin deals with, when you don't have Tom Brady under center. I mean, it's just, this is not <laughs> going to work unless you have Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, or somebody of the same ilk under center, you know, it's just not how this yeah. game works. So anyways, um, the huge digression from the actual game, which is totally fine. Um, but yeah, uh, good talk there. Uh, next one up, we got the Arizona Cardinals going on the road to take on the Los Angeles Rams. Man, the Rams have been tough, uh, even in their losses, right? I think their, their losses so far this season, I think they're what, uh, like two and three here. Uh, losses are against the Niners, you know, who are the best team in football. Eagles, who are like the second best team in football. <laughs> And then the Bengals, who both of us predicted to go to the Super Bowl. So, you know, all their losses, you know, fairly close games. Uh, yeah, it's really impressive what they've been able to do. Got Cooper Cup last week, you know, so Cooper Cup and uh, Puka Nakua. Like, that was that was definitely a combo, I think, to be had there. And then, you know, the Cardinals, yeah, they got torched by Jamar Chase last game. So, obviously, good wide receivers against the Cardinals. Not a good makeup here. So, I got... The the Rams, I think it'll be close though. You know, it's a six and a half game or six and a half point uh, favorite uh, for the Rams here. I think it'll be close just because yeah, the, the Cardinals have been competitive, and then also the Rams, their games have been pretty close too overall. So uh, I feel like even with James Conner going on IR, you know, I think uh, they have the Cardinals have enough weapons to keep it close uh, with the wide receivers, Marquise Brown. Uh, there, Rondale Moore. I think there's enough weapons that they do have to kind of keep it close. I, 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 def- I definitely don't want, you know, if I'm a Carlos fan, I definitely don't want Joshua Dobbs passing like 30 plus times. Like that, you, when you do that, you're, you're, that's just a recipe for disaster. So, uh, but I still believe, yeah, Matthew Stafford has, has had a pretty decent season this season. And then having those two weapons out there and their defense has kept games close too. So, yeah, Rams, I feel comfortable taking the W here. Uh, but yeah, going under uh, the six and a half point uh, spread there. Yeah, um, I'm going to go with the Rams too. I'm going to take the over. I think the Rams need a game where they can put their their stamp on it. I feel like they need a game where they're, you know, kind of kicking the doors down a little bit against the team. It's the first time I feel like they're getting somewhat of a break in their schedule because like you've said, they've, they've had a really tough schedule out of the gate and they've played some really tough games, but you know, you get cut back for an extra week healthy. Obviously, him and Nakua uh, worked out really well last week. Um, Kyron Williams got bottled up a little bit. Um, didn't have much of a game against Philly, so maybe he's able to you know, find more ground in the run uh, game as well as in the air. Um, Stafford was on point last week. I expect him to carry that over. Um, for the Cardinals, you know, to lose Connor on a team that's already pretty thin, um, you know, I don't know what like Dave Mercado is going to bring to the to the table. I mean, I've heard in a lot of ways, Rondell Moore may get more um, of the rushing looks. I don't know if it's like, I don't know what they're going to set up, what kind of offense they'll, they'll kind of run in that, in that sense. But um, just feels like they're a little bit un, you know, undermanned here. Um, yeah. I expect, I don't know. I expect this one to, to be, you know, at least over a touchdown, maybe 10 points, maybe 14 uh, or above, but yeah, at home, I just think you know LA is going to take you know take care of business. Yeah, no, I mean that's uh, like, like I said, Rams have been playing really competitive football. Uh, so, and you know, how much can this Joshua Dobbs uh, hype train like live on? You know, he he finally threw some interceptions last game, so maybe throws a couple here, and uh, yeah, they get blown out. So de- definitely fair game there, for sure. Um, in our next one, we've got the Philadelphia Eagles going on the road to take on the New York Jets. Yeah, this is going to be a good game, I think. Uh, you know, this again, this Jets defense, uh, they're going to be competitive in every single game because of them. And, 
you know, uh, that's where I definitely feel like, you know, could this, uh, could there be a little bit of an upset brewing here? I don't, I don't necessarily think so here. Uh, you know, the Jets, Zach Wilson, I, I, I love the moxie. I love the moxie. I just don't think it's there yet. So yeah, uh, not going to pick, uh, yeah, not, not going to pick the Jets here. So, um, don't know what the spread is actually, but yeah, uh, not going to take the, the Jets. Sorry. Sorry, Jets fans. I've been like on the Jets bandwagon, I feel like all season. I just can't take them here. Okay. I got you. I'm looking up the spread. Um, as we speak, um, come on, internet, help us seven, out. Seven, seven point spread. Yeah, seven. Like, yeah. Man, I, I, that's a tough one, man. That's a tough one. Cause at some point I, I, I do feel like Philly, um, I'm trying to think of the other undefeated teams, San Francisco, like they're going to hit a, a, a bump in the road here, you know? And it's, it's not because the team's better or whatever. It's just like, that's just the way that the, the schedule kind of works out. This is a tough game for Philly. I mean, if you're thinking about it from their perspective, you know, they just played, you know, pretty gritty game on the road against the Rams. Now they're going to continue to stay on the road, uh, go into new, you know, New Jersey, which is pretty hostile environment. It has been so far for, for opponents. Like we saw the chiefs had to play a pretty tough game up there. Buffalo dropped one, um, even with Zach Wilson under, under center. Um, but I'm going to go with Philly to to get the win here because, like you're saying with Zach, it's like for Zach to put together a performance like he did against KC and come back against Denver and go under 200 yards with an interception, no touchdowns, it's like, dude, man, you got to – I don't know. It's like there's got to be some sort of progress. There's got to be like some positivity being strung together here, and it feels like he's just very seesaw. You don't really know what you're going to get. Um, it's always a mixed bag. And, and you know, honestly, we always know what we're going to get with – uh, Jalen Hurts, I feel like so I think the last stat I read was he's like won 22 out of his last 23 games or something in the regular season. Like they're they're absolutely cooking with him as quarterback. The tush push. I mean, everybody's trying to replicate it, but there's just only one man who can really, you know, kind of get it done behind his line and stuff. But guy is so strong, man. He's he's a, like an absolute freak when it comes to, you know, uh, working out his his like lower body strength, like his power. Like I've seen, you know, films of him doing, you know, squats of, you know, I think it's like 500 or more pounds or something like this guy is just, he's an, an all world athlete and got a great head on his shoulders. He's determined. He's a, just an awesome leader, I think. And, uh, it doesn't get celebrated enough. I mean, he doesn't always have like the most, um, outlandish stat lines, you know, for the modern day quarterback, but in a lot of ways, like he doesn't need to do all that stuff. And, at this point, um, you know, AJ has reasserted himself as the new alpha, but it was nice to see like Dallas Goddard get back into some action. He had been, you know, MIA for a while. So he finally got his, his touchdown and, you know, it actually hurt Devonte Smith cause he had a pretty much, uh, you know, a uh, forgettable game. I think he had one catch for six yards last week, but it's like, there's a lot of guys that just kind of step up on this offense to get it done. And we've talked about this defense enough, like as good as we think this Jets defense is, I, I really do think this Philly defense is right there too. Um, with everything that they stack up on that D line and, you know, just the linebackers play very fast. I think their secondary is respectable. Like, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take. They're going to, they're going to have to face like another team that's just riding hot or, you know, somebody on that same shelf as them to take, you know, what I think is going to be their first loss this year. Um, but it's just, I don't think it's going to come, uh, you know, this weekend in New York. Yeah. And, you know, without a uh, Vera Tucker too, for the, the jets, like that's, that's a big thing, especially with those DTs that the Eagles have, like, I don't know who the backups are, but they're a backup for a reason. And Vera Tucker is like one of the better guards, I think, uh, in the NFL and yeah, missing him against, you know, uh, the DTs of the Eagles, that's going to be huge to get that internal pass rush or inside pass rush against Zach Wilson there. So, yeah, I, to, to your point, I want to cheer for whoever the Eagles are going to lose for. I feel like it's going to come. I feel like it's just going to be one of those like blindsided. Oh, how did this happen type of things? But, yeah, I, I, it's going to be hard for me to think it's going to be the 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 Jets here. Um, if they are able to somehow like run the ball and get a rhythm going, great. Like that that can definitely give them a chance there. But yeah, it's just that's just hard to see. I think with this Eagles defense kind of just humming on all cylinders here. For sure, I'm in full agreement here. Uh, you know, Eagles winning this one and uh, you know moving on 
But our next game, we've got the Detroit Lions going on the road to take on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. I because I I went back and forth on this one actually. I was like, oh man, this Bucks team, like you know, they look pretty good. But then obviously this Lions team, they've been looking really good. Uh, it, for me, the difference maker, X factor here, it was like Amon Ross St. Brown. Uh, it's like Dan Campbell says he feels pretty good he's going to be playing this game. Like if St. Brown isn't there, if he's not playing, I'm going to pick the Bucks. honestly. Like he's that much of a difference maker, I feel like, for the Lions, especially against his Buck defense. The Bucks defense, like the passing defense has been really top-notch. Uh, and, you know, with this... Lions defense, it's or what Lions offense, they're gonna be like, all right, let's gonna focus. We're gonna focus on stopping David Montgomery uh from from hurting us and Gibbs as well. You know, make Jared Goff kill us because they don't, you know, what Sam Laporta, rookie tight end, he's been he's he's definitely uh, had some good games for sure. But you know, I'm sure that they they'd feel pretty good about containing him rather than you know trying to uh put eight men in the box and stopping David Montgomery a bunch of times. So. Uh, and yeah, without, I mean, Jameson Williams, you know, he's had a couple, I think he's had like one game or one or two games and he didn't really do too much there. So I think he's still going to try to develop a rhythm and the West of the wide receiver core, like they're, you know, they're formidable, but they're definitely not on the same level of St. Brown. And, you know, with the, with the secondary that the, um, the bucks have, I think you need to have that Amara on St. Brown. So, but yeah, if he's going to be playing this game. Definitely all in favor of the Lions taking this. It's three and a half. I think we'll be close. Maybe just just a field goal or one point, something like that. But yeah, I'm going to be taking the Lions here. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going Lions too. Uh, after watching them last week, I think the things that stood out to me was, you know, down Amon Ross St. Brown. Monty is a different running back as a Lion than he was as a Bear. I mean, we we always. Um, I think got good numbers out of Monty. I think he was always a respectable member of our offense, but you can just totally tell when he's behind, you know, one of the best offensive lines in the game, he is an absolute animal and he was just pounding the rock. He's pretty, uh, you know, fearless when it comes to just running right up the middle. I mean, he breaks tons of tackles. He's just, he's just a power back, man. It's like crazy to see. Cause you know, I always kind of considered him like middle of the road, like expendable type of player and stuff. And, no, I really truly think if if we really had an offensive line in Chicago, we knew how to, you know, design runs for him the right way, you know, we would have been doing every, anything we could to, you know, kind of hold on to him. He kind of reminds me of like a Matt Forte type. And I think the Lions are just banking on it right now and enjoying, you know, what he's able to do week to week. And I don't know if Jameer Gibbs is going to play in this one, but I don't know if it'll truly matter, um, especially getting Amon Ra back. But I will say Khalif Raymond and... uh and Josh Reynolds really had some great catches throughout this, um, you know, past week's game. Obviously, they're playing Carolina, so um, that's one thing. But they definitely looked like NFL starters on the field, able to, you know, create separation, um, catch some pretty difficult passes, you know, make some pretty big plays for them throughout the game. Um, there was one play uh, from last week that just blew my mind, but they basically, I believe it was, uh, I can't remember, I mean, it might have been Raymond running uh, kind of a, uh, an end around type play behind Goff. Goff handed it off. He flipped it to the next guy in line. And then Goff was still standing around. That second guy flipped it back to Goff. So they almost had like a, you know, double end around uh, flea flicker that went to Goff. Goff looked down the, down the field and there was one wide receiver streaking toward the end zone. And the defense kind of like definitely like, you know, went back to kind of guard the the last resort uh, receiver and left Sam Laporta like wide open at, you know, the 15 yard line of Carolinas and wide open pass touchdown. If you haven't seen that play on replay, I it just go check it out, take a look. But I think the thing that, you know, I took away from it is they have so many different weapons on the field at one time that you have to account for at this point where it's like, even if you're down St. Brown, you're out Gibbs like they were last week, they still had enough to put 42 points up on the board. Sam Laporta looks like the steal of the draft at tight end. You know, he's he's been just getting his numbers, but he also just looks like a complete professional out there. And, uh, man, it's just a fun team. Like, they are stifling on defense. Hutchinson's, like, you know, obviously had a, you know, a pick that almost led to a pick six if Chark didn't, you know, take his knees out. And uh, 
even guys like Jerry Jacobs at corner just play, you know, really tough, making big tackles. Uh, Will Harris has been a disruptor at safety. Like, I just like watching this team play football. And, uh, you know, Tampa, I think, has gotten off to a pretty good start as a team. I just, you know, I think there's just a true ceiling there with Baker Mayfield under center. And I I think that's going to matter. And, you know, I think he's gotten off to, again, a really good start for him. It, it, you know, makes a, you know, he can be a candidate to be a starter in the NFL. I think he's like going on his campaign this year, whether it's with Tampa or another team, but, you know, I think they, they hit a little bit of wall here against Detroit. And, uh, you know, I, I would consider taking the over on, on whatever the spread is for Detroit. I mean, Hey, that's, that's totally fair. Uh, Lions are a great team and yeah, it sounds like, you know, they're definitely on their way to win this uh, division here. Like a lot of people predict it. And there's a reason why it's just, they, they're coming up with a lot of moxie, a lot of great attitude. Dan Campbell has been a tremendous coach and everything for them. So yeah, they're definitely a fun team, team to, to watch. Now I, I do recall that uh, Sam will pour to catch. Like, I was like, wow, this is like, a, this is the play of the week for sure for me at least. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was even better live, man. I gotta say I was, I was completely tripped around by what they were doing. And by the time golf had the ball, uh, we all kind of saw Laporta and the streaking wide receiver going down center, but it meant it was awesome. But it's just kind of like this new fun lions team. That's just taking risks and being, <laughs> you know, uh, confident, you know, it's kind of like just the swagger that they're playing with. It's, it's probably extremely refreshing for those in Detroit, but, uh, man, that place got loud. Uh, you know, it's just fun to see their fans kind of into the, you know, into the game and, you know, and yeah. to kind of watch a winner for the first time in a long time. It's just got to feel really damn good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm sure like all the Lions fans are like, wait, what is this? Is this good? This is good, right? This is good. This is good. And no, it's, it's fun to actually, yeah, have them like have that confidence. I feel like to be, you know, fans of like a winning team. So no, it's great. And the coaching, I, I forget who the offensive coordinator was, right. But yeah, he came from last season and, I think he was offered, he might've been offered uh, some positions or some head coaching opportunities or was like maybe question to interview, but he like turned them down because he believed in what the lines are doing. And well, first of all, I think that's great. That's amazing. And then, you know, it just goes to show like the culture. I think Dan Candle is building out there is like, well, people actually want to stay like in Detroit. Like that's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah, like year two into the system with Jared Goff and, yeah, uh, with David Montgomery too. Like they're they're definitely running it on all cylinders right now. So, no doubt, the name is Ben Johnson. Um, oh, yeah. They're OC, so uh, let's keep an eye on him going into this off season. And I'm sure he's going to get some looks for sure um, with what he's done with with obviously Goff and some of these, uh, you know, um, let's say not as established names at you know the outside with wide receivers and kind of what he's done with Jamal Williams last year and kind of with Monty this year it's been it's been pretty impressive yeah for sure yeah well uh, if you want to talk Lions and I don't know if you want to discuss this now but or Detroit but what what did you eat in Detroit that's what I'm curious about now <laughs> man well I first owe you an apology because the downtown area was so bottled up and backed up I mean this place had to be sold out for this game because number one, it was hard to get tickets, but in the same sense, like getting out of Detroit was a nightmare. So we weren't able to go to slows. That was our plan after the game. Uh. Um, but I was, I know, man, I'm sorry. First and foremost, sorry, because we all wanted to go check that out and we read the menu and were, you know, salivating going into this trip. But, uh, we ended up going to shields pizza for Detroit style pizza on the way in. Um, really, really good. Uh, there's something about, that style of pizza when you're really hungry, it's just like doughy and, you know, fluffy and just really good ingredients. But, um, so the pizza, you know, definitely, you know, filled us up. It was really good. Um, tried a burger from, um, the basement burger bar, uh, got pretty high marks on eater in Detroit and, you know, got a pretzel roll burger with a bunch of junk on it. I think it was called the junk burger actually. And it was, Really good. It actually knocked me out on uh, on Friday night. I think I fell asleep like ten minutes after eating. So um, that was great. And then uh, I'm trying to think what else we went to the uh, the DraftKings Sport and Social Bar up in Troy, which was you know probably twenty minutes north of the city. But uh, yeah, definitely wanted to check it out. It was on one of the best bars in Detroit list. But very very cool setup. Like tons of big screens. They had darts they had beer pong uh set up in the back um i think you were able to place bets there wasn't able to 
you know, go out and do that, but had like a big tower of uh, kind of like a sampler tower. It was like 50 bucks, but it had like <laughs> wings. It had uh, nachos on it. It had, um trying to think what else. Um, I know I'm missing something else. Risotto balls, other stuff. Oh, but no, nice. definitely, definitely ate very, very well um, in Detroit. Uh, could barely breathe by the time the trip was over with. So had to, uh, you know, start getting veggies and fruit in me to start off this week. But uh, man, had a had a great time, but definitely, you know, ate ate my uh, brains out. Sounds good. Yeah, no, yeah. And, you know, next time you get, next time you're watching a Lions game or whatever, like, yeah, you definitely got to check out Slows. Maybe before, I don't know if that's possible, but yeah, uh, definitely check out Slows next time. Yeah, definitely reprioritize how we do things when we get downtown. Um, I will say we stayed a little bit outside of downtown in Southfield, so it's mm. about 15 minutes away from the city north of Dearborn. But, um, man, and and this is off the off the cuff, but um, we went to the Henry Ford Museum uh, yesterday, and and that was all awesome. Like it was just a an absolute awesome experience. I didn't have very high expectations going into it, but just the amount of automobiles, vehicles that they have stored in that museum, and some of the historical significance of some of them like they had the rosa parks bus from montgomery alabama in there they had jfk's presidential car where he was actually assassinated that was in the museum as well preserved they had the first ever model t ford like a lot of really cool stuff so if you're just in detroit um looking to get into you know some of the automotive culture that they've you know obviously built a history on like definitely go check that out it's worth the 30 dollars worth the you know two and a half hours that we were there so um highly recommend it yeah and no that, that doesn't surprise me about the rosa parks thing because it was at mike illich uh, the the founder of Domino's. like he i think mm -hmm. he's like a major institution over there he just he passed away like several years ago but yeah he was like a major institution over there uh in detroit i think yeah he was also the, the owner of uh the both the red wings and then also the tigers and i believe the story is that he paid for Rosa Parks is like rent or mortgage or whatever for for like you know ten years, ten plus years or something like that. So really like you know he really admired kind of what Rosa Parks did over there with the bus, and I'm sure he had some influence of like, hey, can we bring this over to uh, to <clears throat> Detroit here uh, to, 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 you know for our museum? Uh, you know maybe we'll give you some pizzas. I don't know what the exchange was, but yeah, <laughs> had a lot of appreciation for Rosa Parks and the civil rights movement. Yeah. Yeah, totally crazy. Like some of the vehicles they had in there and we were just like discussing like what were the bids on these cars? Because if you think about, you know, Dallas wanting the JFK car or Montgomery wanting to preserve that history and, you know, their city or something like these are these are like invaluable, uh, you know, vehicles, like parts of history. So, um, you know, the amount of money in the room in Detroit was was probably pretty sky high, but uh a very cool uh, representation of history. They do just an awesome job. They talk about trains. They talk about cars. They talk about all sorts of, uh, you know, just other vehicles and, and other modes of transportation. Kind of weave a lot of uh, civil rights culture into transportation. Like they talk about civil rights movement in in the like the framework of transportation and stuff. So pretty cool. Um, go check that out. But um, yeah. Anyways. Go Lions, go Detroit, and uh, you know let's let's see them get a W here uh, on the road in Tampa. Sounds good. Who we got next? <laughs> next one, uh, winding down here, the Sunday night game. We've got the New York Giants going on the road to take on the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, this is gonna be a bloodbath. Uh, <laughs> but hey, you know it's New York, it's Buffalo, so it's got to get some TV revenue there. Uh, yeah, Bills for sure, fourteen point favorites. I don't know. This Giants team, this offense particularly just has looked like crap, I feel like. And, you know, there's a lot of, like, talk and conversations on, like, all the Giants, like, Twitter sphere and forums and all about, you know, let's just get rid of Saquon. Let's trade him now. Get him as much, you know, value as we can. Things like that that's happening. So, yeah, the, the Giants, uh, not their year. Not their year whatsoever. Uh, Bills, uh, after that loss against the Jags, they're going to be looking for vengeance. So that's where I'm like, they're going to try to run at the score as much as possible. They're going to go deep. They're going to go, you know, dig, seam route, fly route, whatever, you know, get the big play or, you know, pass it over to uh big play Gabe over there too. 
So I don't know. I just feel like, you know, this Bills team, they're going to be hungry, want to bounce back here, make a statement game, you know, with the, the lights as well on. So I feel like, I don't know. I might go with the over here just to get a little crazy, a 14-point favorite. I think that's like the biggest one this season maybe so far. So, but yeah, this Bills team is, I think they're, they're going to seek out vengeance and uh, not, not put their, uh, not pull their uh, foot off the pedal. Yeah. This is the Miami game from, from last week um, or the one before, but it's, you know, having a big loss like that in a tight game um, won't change the expectations of the team's trajectory, how good they are for the rest of the way. It's just, a bump in the road on their way to, you know, really successful year. I think the hard part for Buffalo is they just had some major injuries. Um, all basically do it secondary at this point. I mean, losing, um, obviously Tredavious white, but then in the last week's game, I mean, to Johnson going down. So it's kind of like, you know, thinking about their, uh, their end goals, what they want to accomplish for the year, super bowl, all that. I mean, it's starting to, you know, get a little bit dicey there uh, injury-wise, but their defensive line has just been absolutely suffocating. Um, Epinesa, Oliver, um, you know, I think they're getting Von Miller back, um, whether or not it was, you know, last week, this week, uh, very soon. Um, it's just they've got strength in numbers. Leonard Floyd has been uh, obviously disrupting back there. It's just uh, it feels like it never really ends. And, uh, yeah, they just they create a lot of pressure, but – you know, offensively, I'm still, you know, I think Gabe Davis ended up having a very solid line for them last week against the Jaguars, but it's, I saw a, another big drop by him. It's just like, I feel like they just really need another, another receiver they can depend on because Diggs does the majority of the work out there. And, you know, James Cook gets involved. It's like, they're really having to try in order to get him his touchdown or get him his big play and stuff. It doesn't just happen naturally. So, I mean, look, that's the downside for the bills. It's like, they can be kind of one dimensional, um, on the offensive side at times, but yeah, their defense has definitely stepped up and, you know, made them a very like legitimate threat out there. Um, for New York, I mean, when does the bleeding stop? It's kind of crazy to think this team was in the playoffs last year. Um, I have like really no confidence in them, um, right now, or even going forward. Like if they were playing a lesser opponent, I might give them a puncher's chance at a victory, uh, just to get them on the board a little bit, but I mean, the way that Seattle controlled them at the line, um, I mean, it was it was suffocating for, for Daniel Jones to find some time back there and to go against probably the best pass rush in the game on the road. He's going to get killed. So, you know, whether it's 14, whether it's 10, whether it's, you know, 20, like, those are winning. Um, you know, 14 is a pretty big spread, <laughs> you know, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll go with the under just to be, just to be, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit polite here. It's in New York, but man, yeah, they're going to get beat. Yeah. I mean, to your point, like the bills pass rush this season has been, I think like top three. So yeah, they're, they're going to get after Daniel Jones and try to end this thing as soon as they're, I think their goal is to take him out the game. Like they're going to take him out the game as soon as possible. Uh, the bills are. So I, I think that's going to be their, what they're going to be seeking to do, seek and destroy. And yeah, I don't know. 14 point spread. That's going to be a fun one to play with. Uh so but you know, we'll see if Daniel Jones is able to make a couple plays on his feet, you know, get the first downs, but I just don't see that with this tough Bills defense. Uh you know, yeah, like you mentioned, even though the secondary's been beat up, yeah, I just the, the Giants really don't have the weapons. Like they just really don't have the weapons I feel like to, you know, do anything with that. Uh Walrus play decent here and there, but like, you know, uh, they need more. They need more from the wide receiver core. I know they invested, you know, some money, some draft capital on that in the off season, but it's just not enough here. So, yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be paying attention about the over here. I'm gonna be paying attention to the over here against the, against the the Bills. Yeah, I mean, when you start talking about Wandell Robinson being you know, the key <laughs> ad for the Giants, I mean, you know, you know, things are starting to get a little sketchy over there. So. uh yeah. yeah, man, I'm having no faith right now. Um, can't really say whether or not I think this reflects poorly on Dable. I just think their their line has been getting exposed. I'd love to see how they do against Buffalo this week. If it's another, you know, game of unrelenting pressure from Buffalo, I mean, it's just like they may just be undermanned on on their front line there. But yeah, man, um, 
good luck. Good luck, Giants. Uh, hope you guys all survive, you know, your night in Buffalo. But uh, it's going to be an ugly one, I think. Yeah, yeah. And let us know. Who do you want Saquon to be traded to? <laughs> Whose picks do you want? So, yeah. We'll see. Um, this last one here, Monday Night Football, we got the Dallas Cowboys going on the road um, into uh, into L.A. to take on the Chargers. This is going to be a fun one. This is going to be a fun one indeed. Uh, you know, I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to pick the Chargers. Chargers are two-point underdogs here. Uh, you know, I definitely kind of doubted them a little bit. I'm like, man, this team is way too talented to, you know, have like a losing record. Uh, you know, I think they bounce back here. I think on the, you know, Chargers playing at home, uh, they get their, it looks like they're going to get Austin Eckler back, which great, you know, uh, Austin Eckler, you know, he, he isn't exactly the, like the known for being like an explosive runner necessarily. So, but at the same time, like having that uh, assurance of Austin Eckler there, I think just builds confidence for both, you know, Justin Herbert and Kellen Moore in the, uh, you know, offensive play calling. So, and, you know, I, I feel like that's just going to be a big deal. And he, he has been averaging seven yards per carry, albeit I think he's only like attempted 17 attempts so far. So, but yeah, he's, he's, he's been playing, you know, when he's on the field, he's been playing well this season. So, and Khalil Mack just came off a six sack game. Uh, if they're able to get pressure, you know, him, Bosa, if they're able to get pressure against Dak Prescott, Prescott's going to throw some INTs. Like, that's that's for sure going to happen. And I think that will happen. I think that will happen. I know the Cowboys, they have one of the better offensive lines, and I think it's healthy now. But, yeah, like one of the better offensive lines in all of football. But, you know, the Chargers at home you know, with all the crowd, Monday night, right? Like, I feel like the, the pass rush, whether it's Bo or Cole Mack, is going to be able to get over there. And then Asani Samuel uh, or, you know, one of the defensive backs over there will be able to get some sort of a pick and, you know, uh, turn over the ball there and, yeah, uh, give the ball over to Justin Herbert, which he'll know to, what to do with those wide receiver talent that they have right there. So, yeah, Chargers pulling off the upset here against the Cowboys, you know, in front of the big lights. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm 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 there. Uh yeah, return of the Mac. Khalil Mac coming back. Obviously his six acts. He had four QB hits as well that day. Um for anybody playing IDP, maybe one of the most successful days in the office of all time. Uh I'd have to you know, fact check on that one just as far as points go. But man, yeah, if he's if he's coming back, um, you know, for that unit, that'll be huge. They're They've really uh, been up against it, I think, out of the gate so far on the defensive end, um, giving up a lot of yardage, um, a lot of points. Obviously, they played Dolphins and had a pretty big uh, run-up game at the beginning of the year. Um, but I think they're starting to come around a little bit as a defense. I mean, at the very least held the Raiders to 17 before going on bye. You know, they get that little bit of a break before taking on Dallas, who just got absolutely steamrolled by the 49ers for all those that were watching. I mean, it's again, it goes back to confidence and Anytime there's a big game with big spotlight for Dak, he always seems to underwhelm. Um, you know, just plays average to below average football, doesn't put his team in position to win games or stay competitive, and almost felt like at a certain point they just kind of gave up. I mean, they just look like they gave up. Um, there's no reason why a defense as stout as theirs should be giving up, you know, 40-plus points to the Niners, as good as the Niners are, just kind of felt like, you know, they were talking a little bit smack. They got hit in the mouth, and, uh, yeah, they just decided to kind of relent and let the San Francisco 49ers do whatever they wanted to them after that point. So, you know, it's about character. It's resolve. And, uh, yeah, they just seem to lack that. I mean, honestly, they just don't seem to have, like, much backbone. And, you know, it's great if they can go ahead and, like, pound some of the bottom feeders in this league. But anytime they take on a top-ranked opponent, they just seem to, like, you know, get the deer in the headlights type expression and just, you know, they end up, you know, waffling and kind of losing, losing the game. So, you know, the Chargers, they're a playoff team. I mean, they've, they've been consistently in the playoffs uh, in recent years. And, you know, I think they're also trying to get themselves back into, you know, contention, get themselves into maybe a wild card type position. Um, having Eckler back definitely helps. So we'll see how he's reincorporated back into the offense. It desperately, you know, needs him out of the backfield with what Josh Kelly has been kind of you know, piecing together week to week. But uh, yeah, man, uh, Herbert has looked great. You get your, you know, your main weapon back. They're going to, they're going to put up some points here. Um, hopefully their defense can just hold tight and uh, I expect a close one, but I think the Chargers go over. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and the Cowboys, like, their their wins so far this season, right? You know, they've beaten the Giants. They beat in the Jets. Uh, and I think it was the first game with Zach Wilson starting. And uh, and then yeah, they, they beat in the Patriots, right? So, you know, two of those teams, two, two, two of those three teams, not so good. And, yeah, they lost to uh, the Cardinals and then also, yeah, the 49ers, obviously. So, you know, it was kind of a bad loss there with the Cardinals. And then, yeah, uh, Patriots, Giants, not that, not that good teams as we're seeing right now. And then, yeah, the Jets, you know, Zach Wilson's, that was his first game, uh, you know, starting. So he was definitely kind of, you know, uh, kind of getting in, in the weed of things there, uh, especially on the road. Very challenging. But, yeah, against a talented Chargers team with Justin Herbert, uh, who has played really, like, pretty damn well, I think, actually, this season. Uh, you know, I think, yeah, it's just going to uh, see if he's able to take a kind of a next step against this Cowboys defense. You know, yeah, they do have Micah Parsons and uh, Bland has, been, play, has played pretty well, you know, too. So, yeah, if they're able to get some points on this on this defense, you know, good luck Cowboys against the Chargers and uh, Dak Prescott kind of taking over against that pass rush. So, uh, yeah, but I feel like the Chargers are going to be able to pull it off here. Yeah, I'm with you. And, you know, Chargers are inconsistent as well as a team, but um... – Hopefully with more of their parts back, maybe a guy like J.C. Jackson getting rid of him is going to be good for their team in the long run. Maybe it's an attitude thing. Maybe it's, you know, maybe getting a little bit away from the star power in L.A. and just kind of trying to find guys who more naturally fit into the team can gel, you know, together on the defensive end or something like that. But, yeah, if they can get their D to be average to respectable, I mean, this team... You know, could be a pretty big threat, you know, in the wild card, uh, you know, even though they got Staley as their head coach. I think, uh, you know, they still got a lot of talent there to uh, to get W's. Yeah, that's the X factor. It's like, who can be, who can make more dumb decisions there? Mike McCarthy in the clock management, who's notorious for the worst clock <laughs> management, or Brandon Staley. Like, there's going to be like two people with clocks there. Like, what the hell do I do right now? And uh, yeah, that's like one thing to be paying attention is the last two minutes of this game. If it's close, right? It's like, who's going to be the first one to screw up? Or the last one, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. No. Two of the biggest boneheads, I think, uh, wearing headsets uh, in the NFL right now, for sure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right. Well, with that, that's the full rundown here for Week Six. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments section. Like, subscribe if you haven't already. Um, you know, if you're on Instagram at Ball and Breakfast, uh, we're also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts as well. So. Check us out wherever you're at. Um, we're going to kick it off to Wayne to give his final thought for tonight, and uh, it'll then be a wrap. Yeah, thanks, Pat. My my final thought, you know, I was it's definitely food-related, but um, a lot of people were talking about soup at work uh, because it, it is getting a little bit colder. But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go the different route. I'm going to get colder. So I actually bought a, an ice cream uh, maker machine, not nothing too high tech or anything like that. So, but I plan plan on making ice cream. I'm gonna start off vanilla, you know, start off basic. I got some Oberweiss milk, some whole whole milk, you know, with very rich and everything, um, and some creamer. And then I also bought brought, uh, bought some strawberries. So, gonna mix in some strawberries in there as well, and I'll give it a little bit more flavor there. So, but uh, Pat, my question to you is, what kind of ice cream do you like? Uh, what brands do you like? You know, do you have any certain favorites that you just enjoy? Yeah, man, I've always been pretty partial to Ben and Jerry's. Maybe it goes back to like my youth or, you know, when we were first discovering out of the box ice cream companies, flavors that we never had before. And just kind of like the richness, the indulgence of like what Ben and Jerry's is. But like, I've always enjoyed kind of all their mashups, like going, you know, putting the new core into a lot of their flavors with, you know, whatever it could be cookies, caramel, whatever else is just kind of, you know, dead in the center. Um, all the toppings that they do. I love, you know, chocolate chip cookie dough is a classic of theirs. Uh, you know, I think they have, uh, the Jimmy Fallon one's pretty good. Um, yeah. Tonight dough or the Americone dream with, uh, Stephen Colbert is pretty yeah. good. And I am missing another one, Chubby Hubby, I've always liked too, with the pretzels mm -hmm. and peanut butter and everything else. These days, I mean, it's a very rich decision to make. Like if I'm going Ben and Jerry's, like I know I'm having 
you know, to, to play a lot of catch up the next couple of days of my diet and stuff like that. Or, you know, maybe just having a, a quarter a night, a third a night or something like that of the pint, whatever it could be. But back in the day, man, used to just get the pint, just knock it all down one sitting for sure. Um, but I'd say outside of that, I think on the last episode or two, we were talking about maybe more healthier options. I, the, the brand that I was talking about last time was Talenti. Um, mm. I really like some of their flavors. Like I've gone with their raspberry sorbet. I've tried, um, obviously like their cold brew coffee is pretty good. I think coffee to me is like one of my most consistent flavors because it's just that good middle ground. You know, it's like, I don't have to have all the excess sugar and like, yeah, the toppings or whatever else it just adds like fat, uh, cholesterol, all the other good stuff. And it's just like coffee is just, you know, there's still going to be sugar there, but in the same sense, like it, the, the, it, the taste is just more mild. It's got like that just bold coffee flavor, which I like, and just a little bit of sweetness and stuff. So, um, I feel like that's always just a safe move for me. Um, regardless of that, I think like, uh, if we're staying on ice cream, maybe it still counts, but I, I really do like these natural fruit bars that are like frozen fruit bars that are kind of ice cream, um, related, almost like a popsicle in a lot of senses, but just hundred percent fruit juice. I just feel like it's uh refreshing, especially in like the spring, summertime and stuff. Um, I'll have to get back to you on brand names and stuff, but I've had a, a few different types of boxes over the last, uh, summer here where it's like, I just know I can go to it and, and you know, it's going to have a little bit of sugar in it, but in the same sense, like it's, it's a little bit better of an alternative than just straight up ice cream. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, no, from the healthier option, like I guess, yeah, getting a sorbet seems like, you know, pretty nice option. I definitely agree with on the Talenti raspberry. I feel like each time I get that it maybe lasts, maybe lasts like two days. Like <laughs> sometimes I'll just take it in one sitting. I mean, in my twenties more so, I would just take it, eat it in one sitting and like probably be done in like 15 minutes because that stuff is like, it, it It just goes down really smoothly. Like it, it's not heavy at all and it tastes delicious. It just tastes delicious. So uh, whatever they put in that, amazing there. Um, but yeah, I am a big fan of, I guess, like the Jenny's ice cream stores now that, that they're like around. I, I definitely like a lot of their flavors that they have. Um, solid to straw, like in the Pacific Northwest, that was something I usually got any, any place I can just go and try like those small spoons and just like have like a couple, uh, you know, scoops of ice cream and a tiny spoon and then pay like six bucks for like one scoop, <laughs> one big scoop of ice cream or something. I told, I'm, I'm totally down for that. Like a little bit of variety. And then, yeah, you get the one that you choose at the end and you pay a significant price there. But yeah, those places I, I tend to. Well, I can enjoy even during the winter. So, yeah, I'll let you know how this uh, ice cream making turns out. Uh, hopefully it turns out bad so I don't, you know, eat a bunch and make a bunch and, you know, get all heavy and everything. But, yeah, very much looking forward to playing around with my new toy here. It sounds pretty good. Like, what is your what is your end goal with it? Like, what do you want to end up being able to make uh, with your machine? I mean, some sorbets, too. Uh, maybe I'll make that raspberry sorbet instead of, you know, paying all the, the money to Talenti, which I think is owned by, like, one of the bigger companies there. So, but yeah, I, something like that I think would be good. Um, I definitely like mint. Like, I want to try different co combinations of, like, chocolate mint. And, you know, I don't know if I can... I don't know if I have the guts yet to like make like a, I, I usually do like a caramel, like a Rocky road type as well. So, you know, I don't know for me, it's just like something to play around with, you know, all the variations and yeah, I get to play with ice cream, but yeah, maybe, maybe I will look into healthier options as I get like the first iteration done with, uh, with, you know, whole milk and, and kind of that, you know, basic type of recipe there. Sounds pretty good. Um, for me, I was going to go into Detroit and their, and their food, uh, seemed to cover a lot of the big ones in our Detroit Tampa matchup there, but, um, maybe I'll just stick on breakfast cause I didn't cover that. And, uh, I had two really good breakfasts, uh, in Detroit. One was at the Jagged Fork, um, ended up getting, uh, an item that I haven't gotten in a long time, uh, chilaquiles, um, Mexican breakfast. It's basically like tortilla chips, salsa verde. Um, you've got egg. I think they also add, at least for this version, they had um, a layer of hash browns and cheese at the bottom. So it's just kind of like this very tangy, sour, savory, you know, type skillet. And uh, 
Yeah, man, it just brought me back a little bit. Like when I used to study abroad and live in Mexico, got really into chilaquiles. I feel like my host mom at the time used to make them all the time and would add like her homemade habanero salsa to them. And it's just like that, that sour tanginess of like the salsa verde over the top. And then just, there's also chicken in it too. I forgot to mention, but like grilled chicken in the skillet as well. But it's just like everything mashed up together. It was just perfect. And yeah, really good joint in Detroit. Um, so go check that out if you're, you know, in the Motor City. Um, the other thing I'll throw a plug out there for, um, just had a really good bagel from a local bagel shop there. Um, I think the owner was like from New York, but you know, just very like warm, uh, everything bagel. Um, the one thing I will say that is definitely a New York thing, but I'm not as into is just the, the, the amount of cream cheese that they'll actually throw in the bagel itself. It's just like spilling out on all ends, but I mean, still very good. Um, glad I had it. It was, you know, I got some yogurt and a banana with it on the side from the grocery store. So it was kind of like just this good, like piece together breakfast and stuff. But, uh, yeah, man, I was just going to throw out there, I guess. I mean, while we're on breakfast for ball and breakfast, uh, we, I think we have covered breakfast in the past in different angles, but maybe like, what is your favorite, um, maybe from another culture or ethnicity, but like, what's your favorite, uh, like out of the box breakfast item or entree? Man, that's a good one. That's a good question. Um, I mean, the Filipino side, you know, definitely like my longanisa, eggs, rice, like that's usually my go to is like a nice sausage uh, there. And then, I mean, obviously, Mexican breakfasts are a staple, uh, you know, I, yeah, there's like the things like, uh, well, maybe not like cultural, well, maybe a different kind of culture, if you, you know, if you know what I mean, but like fried chicken and waffles, man. I love some good old fashioned <laughs> fried chicken and waffles. Um, there was a place, I don't know if it's still open now. It's, it, it was in Seattle, but it was like a Korean fried chicken, uh, waffle place. So it's like got all, has all the flavors of a Korean fried chicken, right? Which, you know, you, you, you think of your typical American fried chicken, right? It's maybe just spicy or something and, you know, crunchy, but here it's like, you know, you got some soy or some garlic. Uh, type of fr uh, Korean fried chicken, but then yeah, you, you combine that with a nice like honey butter uh, syrup, and then also waffle to die for there. Um, definitely a big fan of like anything like eggs Benedict, uh, chilaquiles, like you mentioned before. Uh, I think all those things are you know amazing. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. Whenever I I do go like go to like Europe, like a, you know a Germany or like. A, in Iceland, it was it was all about just like getting kind of like a charcuterie board, basically, <laughs> while you're eating there. Like you get everything kind of just given to you there with all the different like cut meat and everything. And I know I enjoy that. It's like it's it's kind of light, but you get that protein fixation. They combine that with some toast or something as well. That's all good for me. So yeah, I think those are those are a couple and then also the variety of donuts out there as well uh <laughs> japanese donuts whether it's a mochi nut or whatever like all those things are delicious as well so i, I like a little bit of combination of everything oh and then yeah you know want, want to go like more european the croissants as well definitely a big <laughs> fan of any type of croissant uh you know i i definitely have a favor of almond croissants a little bit or yeah like almond croissants you know, maybe with like a little bit of apple in there too so different things like that i'm all about that pastry life like give me some pastries take me to a pastry or bakery shop and i'll just go all all you know happy in there dude i i, I just like abundance uh in the morning and like I, <laughs> I don't care how big the breakfast is like i just love eating a ton of food yeah uh, in the mornings it's sometimes hard to do if you're you know, on the road to work or, um, you got a lot stacked up early in the morning and stuff to just, you know, get what you really want. But it, when I can sit down and have like a real, you know, full breakfast, I just love that, uh, that feeling, uh, then, and then afterwards for the rest of the day. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I mean, I think the, the one cool thing about like, like having a nice hearty breakfast, like on a weekend or something is that you, you burn it off, like basically the rest of the day, like, yeah, maybe you skip lunch, maybe you don't snack as much or, you know, you can walk around um so yeah i feel like having a good a good breakfast brunch on a sunday or month or saturday like good way just to spend a weekend and just you know relax a little bit there for sure um 
Well, yeah, no, this was uh, obviously a good episode again with week six. Um, thinking about what to get for breakfast uh, throughout <laughs> this week into the weekend. We'll definitely be considering that. Maybe grabbing some ice cream, uh, you know, one of these weekend nights. And then, hey, uh, you know, sure enough, uh, Wayne's actually going to be in D.C., uh, you know, staying out here in Virginia on the northern end. Uh, over at my place so hopefully by uh our week seven episode we're able to you know bring it to you live from from my place so uh you know keep an eye out for that uh looking forward to it and uh you know we'll catch you guys all in the next episode so with wayne i'm patrick signing off for the ball and breakfast podcast